Good morning, at least to those of you on the East Coast of the United States. Welcome. Very nice to uh, to see you all. I guess I'll give you a f little time to filter into the into the room. Um, I'm Lex McCusker. I'm the director of student entrepreneurship programs at uh, GW, and I welcome you to uh, our IS ICSB Global GW School of Business uh, session. Um, the topic today is pitching yourself and your idea. What do prospective investors want to see, hear, and feel about you? Um, but before I start, I want to do a couple of things. First of all, I want to uh, thank the ICSB Global and the GW School of Business for inviting us to this session today, especially uh, conference chair uh, Kathy Corman Fry, and of course, Iman uh, Tarabishi, the president and CEO of the ICSB. So thank you uh, both for having us. Um, before I introduce uh, Amy, um, let me do a couple of preliminary things. I wanted, so here's the agenda. Here's how we're going to, uh, we've carved up the hour uh, that's ahead of us. Uh, the first thing is that we're going to do some poll, a quick poll. We've got four poll questions uh, to help us get a sense of who's in the audience and also uh, for you to get a sense of who's in the audience. Um, we have a yes, no, kind of a simple minded thing, just four questions. Um, and we'll get through those pretty quickly uh, to get a sense of, of who's out there. Um, then I will do introductions. We'll do formal introductions so you'll know who, who you're talking to. And then uh, Amy and I are going to chat. I'll, I'll moderate. Um, uh, I have a confession to make. We are, we are old friends. And so I think that at some points it's going to sound like you're uh, listening in on a private conversation. But uh, uh, we'll try to be mindful of the audience. And I, I, I'm, I'm confident that you'll learn something. Uh, for a bunch of reasons. And then we will leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So there'll be time for audience questions. Um, I think you'll be able to put those into the chat and, and I think will be a, a, a great way to end up the session. Okay, so that's how, we, that's how we're gonna do it. Let's start now uh, with the poll questions. We have four poll questions. We, we, it, it's it's simple-minded, so forgive us. It's just yes, no questions to get some sense of the, of the, the demographics. So, um, uh, yeah, Tammy, if you put the poll up, that'll be great. Uh, the first question is we want to we want to get a sense of uh, how many men and women are in the audience. So please, if you're a woman, say yes. If you're a man, say no. Obviously, you don't have to answer these questions if you don't want. Also want to know uh, if you're currently a student. So we're looking to get a sense of how many students are in the audience. We want to know if you are currently working on a startup in any way, shape or form. So uh, you don't have to be a founder. You don't have to be working on it full time, but any uh, to what extent are you engaged with that? And then I'd love to know how many folks have some experience pitching to investors. And I'll broaden that category. So I'm interested in if you were in like a, a pitch competition, if you've pitched at uh, the, like something like the new venture competition at GW or some equivalent to that. Um, again, we'd like to get a sense of how much experience you have and, and how much of this is, is completely new to you. So let's take just a minute or two. And if you would uh, fill out the form, it looks like uh, Seventy percent have voted so far. So uh, the rest of you, obviously, not not obliged to vote, but uh, but if you can go in and, uh, and 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 click answers to those four questions, that'd be grand. We're we getting there. Eighty-seven percent. All right, I think uh, voting seems to have stopped. So, uh, Tammy, if you would, let's let's share the results with everybody. Oh, so this is this is pretty good. So, um, yep, mostly women. That's great. Glad to hear it. Um, more students than not, but a, but a, but a good healthy mix. This is this is great. Um, folks are engaged in this topic, working on a startup. A uh, few of you have had some experience uh, pitching, so uh, we'll we'll look to you to help uh, supplement the conversation with your your experience. That'll be great. But I think this is just the the perfect audience for us. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time with that. All right, so let's get to uh, introductions. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. I'm Lex McCusker. As I said, I'm the director of student entrepreneurship programs at uh, here at George Washington University. Um, those of you who are not from GW, so some of you are not students, but uh, GW has a, a robust set of programs, both academic programs and co-curricular programs to support student entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activities. Um, I'm, I'm in the, the 
uh, non-academic side of the house. I'm a, our, our organization is a staff organization that supports uh, students, faculty, staff, and alumni across GW who want to work on uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. By way of background, um, I worked for 23 years at AT&T and Bell Laboratories. I'm, a, I'm an R&D person by, by trade. Um, I have a PhD in experimental psychology, so I, I can read your mind. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's harder through the Zoom, I have to confess, but, 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 but seriously. Um, and I have worked in academia for quite a bit. I, I was the dean of the business school at Stevens Institute in Hoboken, New Jersey. So those of you from Jersey, uh, shout out to, to all of you. Um, and I've been here at GW now about eight years working on, on, on student entrepreneurship. So that's my background. Um, and I think that puts an end to the preliminaries. Let me do a quick introduction to Amy. Uh, Amy Millman, um, who is in her car at the moment, but we'll get her into a, uh, you know, a more stable uh, IT environment in a few minutes. She's the president of Springboard Enterprises and has been at Springboard since the year 2000. Uh, before that, she was the executive director of the National Women's Business Council for seven years. And I believe you also did some stint, some time as a lobbyist uh, somewhere along the line. She has definitely a- Definitely did. Yeah. yeah. She has a I master's- definitely did. Uh that's okay. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You don't have to uh, have to apologize for that. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding, of course, and sorry for being irreverent for those of you who have no sense of humor. You want me to talk? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Hang on. I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, she, okay. she also has a master's degree in public policy from a prestigious uh, East Coast University, George Washington, uh, in public public administration, right? That, that's what... So uh, Amy has spectacular credentials, and uh, that's the reason we, we, we chose her to, uh, to tell us about this topic. So now, Amy, if you would just tell us a few things about Springboard Enterprises. I, I didn't do it justice, and I know you've been doing this for a long time, way before it was fashionable. So, yeah. so give us some of the background on Springboard, what it is, what it does, and especially those, those, those gee whiz numbers. I mean, you have some wonderful accomplishments yeah, over the years. And it's been a great year for, for entrepreneurs. So uh, I know a lot of people say differently about women in general, but for women entrepreneurs, especially those in technology and life science, uh, a banner year. So I have a lot of interesting things to talk about. But, um, and again, I, I apologize for being in my car, you know, everybody else around our life. Uh, uh, schedule schedule actually um which was at Carnegie Mellon So, Amy, we are losing some of your Allen University. All right, all right. Let's see if I can get back to a place where you can hear me. Can was that it better or no? We missed the last thirty seconds to a minute. So, oh no, I'm so sorry. Um, so, um, I, I don't know if you if I mentioned the fact that you know I got my. I learned my tech chops from uh, being at Carnegie Mellon in my undergraduate, where mm -hmm. we were, where every single person on the campus, whether you were in engineering or the arts, had to uh, learn, you know, computer science in some way or use it in some way. Um, and that was an interesting introduction to, you know, what was to become, you know, the real new world. And I, uh, and so the, so the interesting thing about, about what, you know, what carries through, you know, your education is, you know, what, how do you apply a lot of this to, you know, to your thinking and your education and, um, and then recognizing, you know, changes that are happening in the environment or even disrupting all this, um, you know, amazing opportunities that are out there. Um, and I am home, so I'm going to be walking while I uh, get into a better place. So, um, so, so I will say this: it, it's been a it's been a wild ride. I have an amazing 
uh, have had amazing experience at Springboard. So a little bit about Springboard is that we've been around 20 years, as Lex said. It started with a challenge that uh, uh, some Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalists said that if there were any women uh, running companies they would invest in, they would know them. And, and we said, well, we'll be your deal source. Uh, and, uh, and the focus was really to help people with access to capital. And so the, the whole experience has really been about connecting entrepreneurs um, to sources of capital and other resources that will help them grow their companies, achieve their dreams, whatever you know that entails. And so, as uh, as Lex said, it's all about the numbers. We've had about 850 companies go through Springboard in 20 years, um, all technology driven, and all led by women. And they've raised about, I don't know, it's about $13 billion for their companies. But um, if you include um, all the sales and acquisitions that have happened, it's about a $27 billion value into the economy. And of course, return for investors. So that's been the real exciting aspect of all of this. Um, for me, it really is about watching the journey and the decision making and the use of education and experience to build scalable and sustainable businesses. Wow. So th th this is so impressive to me, and I, and, and I, I want to make sure that everybody gets a, gets a grasp of this. And this is 800 plus companies, a vast majority, 80, 88% of them have raised money uh, at, at some point. Uh, over 20 of them have, have IPO'd, gone public. Um, 200 uh, M&A events. So, so if, if there's anybody in the world who, who knows about uh, women's entrepreneurship and what it takes to be successful in that, it, it, it's Amy Millman. So Amy, we're, we're thrilled to have you here. It's a great opportunity to, uh, to mine some of the, uh, the expertise and, and knowledge that you have. To, to, let's focus if we could. Yeah. That's better. Okay, we've That's connected. Better. That's great. T talk a little bit about pitching. So t today the topic about, is about pitching. And I know you, how, how many how many pitches have you heard? I, I, I've heard hundreds, maybe even thousands. I, I'm guessing you've heard like billions, right? So <laughs> tell us more about that. And then I'm especially interested in, in dolphin tanks. Tell us what about, so how, pitching in general okay. and dolphin tanks in particular. All right, so let's start with pitching. So a lot of what we learned when we were going through school was how to tell a story. You know, it's like the ham, we call it the hamburger model, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Well, that's not exactly what happens in, in a pitch. Um, uh, and it all depends on who you're giving the pitch to. So if you're selling your product to somebody, that's one pitch. Um, if you're talking to people about your product only, it's not a sale, but you're explaining what the product does, that's another pitch. And then there's the pitch that you give to investors. And so the pitch to investors is the one that we've mostly focused on. Um, although, you know, we're expert at all of those pitches um, and they all have nuances, but the ones to investor, everybody actually forgets that it's about the money and the numbers. It's about the investors care mostly about the transaction. So they're, you know, they'll get interested in your product, but they want to know how it grows, how it makes money, when they'll get their money back, what, how much money are you going to need? And in order to get it to a point where it's like a Google or a Microsoft or a, you know, for me, uh, um, all kinds of scalable uh, companies that will return, uh, you know, a big payoff for the investors. And most people get so involved with their, their, the intricacies of their product or even the reason why they started this, which is usually not the business case for it. So at Springboard, we spent a lot of time 
um, uh, redoing pitches to focus on making the business case. And that is foreign to most people because otherwise, you know, you don't usually go into starting a business by saying, you know, I want to make money for my investors. No, you go into a business um, saying, uh, you know, a few things. One, I want to make a difference. I think I have this idea that's going to change things um, or make it easier, better, faster, cheaper. Um, I want to make a lot of money. Um, and some people, I like to hire a lot of people, um, but ultimately, you're, you're not, you don't start that with trying to make investors rich. So if you focus on what it is they need to hear, then that makes a big difference. Um, and and it, it's, it's always fascinating to me. And we listen to it in the new venture competition all the time in the beginning on the interviews. It's, you know, I, I have this idea of doing something that is going, that ha was personal to me. And I need to go and and fix that because I think a lot of other people probably say have the same problem. Uh, and so now it's, all right, so you could be a market of one and you need to go figure out if a lot of other people do have that problem and would they pay for it? And once you know if they pay for it, you can price your product, you can talk about how it makes money, you can see how you can grow your market um, and what the potential is for that market to grow. Fantastic. So tell us, tell us about dolphin tanks. I, I know what a shark tank is. What's a dolphin tank? So um, years ago, we were, um, uh, we were working with Dell, uh, you know, Dell Corporation, and, uh, and they were wanting to bring entrepreneurs together somewhere in the world, um, uh, uh, their global uh, prospects. And, and what was it that would help entrepreneurs get to know each other as well as Dell get to understand who was in the room? So we, we actually, we were in Rio de Janeiro and um, doing a program with Dell. And, and they said, what would you do? And we put our heads together and we said, well, we could do a pitch, but it's not for money. It would be for information. So I would present my business and talk about what I was doing and some of the challenges. And so a different kind of pitch. And, and the end of it would be, how can the audience help? And all, all of a sudden, the, you know, the, all the people in the room had similar businesses and they could help each other saying, oh, I, I could make that intro for you or hmm, I've had that same problem. Here's how I worked it out. Meanwhile, Dell got to sit there and sort of understand the businesses in the room a lot better. And that was, we called that the dolphin tank. And it's the question is not, you know, how do we, how do we, how do you compete with everybody for money? No, it's how do you talk about your business and what you need to be successful and how can the people around you help you get there? So how can I help? And so we've done uh, hundreds of these all around the world and um, many of these um, uh, entrepreneurs, they give a three minute pitch. And then we talk for about 20 minutes or so about what they need and what we heard, what we liked about what was going on. And then, all right, you know, who can help this person with that particular ask? So I'll tell you a quick story. One of the first things I did when I came to GW, and it was eight, eight years ago, and just it was the dolphin tanks. So, you know, you should go, go to these dolphin tank things. And so I, I went, it was at night and was in Duquesne Hall. And I was astounded. And there they were a half dozen pitches, maybe four. I don't know, not even half dozen. Some of them were really good. Some of them were awful, to be honest with you. But every one of those people came away encouraged, uh, supported with some, you know, actionable thing that they could do to move their venture forward. And, you know, I mean, even the ones that were really dumb kind of 
got feedback that was constructive and helpful and pushed them forward in just the right way. I, it, it, it's a spectacular event. And, and before we go today, I'm going to encourage everybody to, to sign up for a dolphin tank. But anyway, let me let me go back to investors. Tell me, so I, I get the investors want to know how you how they're going to make money. Yeah, I, and, and I know that, that for us that goes without saying. But sometimes students don't get that. I mean, it's 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 kind of a funny thing. They think they. So what are they looking for? I, I get that they look they want to see you know a nice income statement and all that stuff. But what is it they're looking for in an, in an entrepreneur? And what 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 matters to them? What gives them confidence that they can make money with the invest with the pitch they're hearing? You know, it's there's not a one. One answer to that, Lex, that's mm -hmm. the interesting part about this. It's really personal. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the, you know, every investor has a different thesis. You know, things they're actually in, interested in investing in, their expertise, not all investors invest in everything. So, again, once you have already know that that investor or that investor group or angel group, you know, there are seed investors, we call them, they're individual investors, they're angel groups, they'll invest together, there are venture capital at all different levels, you know, some are invest very early, some later, and then there's private equity, they invest larger. So A, understand what the interest of that particular investor or investor group likes to invest in. And so that requires doing your homework. But once you get in to pitching to a relevant investor, all of a sudden that changes everything because then you have to think like them. So um, Alex, you didn't mention it, but I did uh, specifically, but I, I was a lobbyist for a pretty long time mm -hmm. and most of my career until I got involved with this. And and I've never looked back, I want you to say. Um, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, I love being a lobbyist. And I was a lobbyist for Philip Morris, the tobacco guys. Really? And uh, although tobacco and food and everything else. And, yeah. and so you had to be really creative about how you approach people. So you needed to know who was in the room, you know, who you were going to visit, what their interests were, and how you could relate to them. It's the same thing right, with entrepreneurs and investors. So you walk in and your, focal, your, your first instinct is to tell them in detail about your product. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, most of them couldn't care less. What they care about is, is it a business or is it a product? If it's just a product, it's not going to be of interest to them. And so the spending the time either educating them about the market or educating them about the details of your product and how it works should be, you know, a minute, a minute and a half, maybe. And, and each person who comes to pitch has a, has a core competency that is important for everybody to know. All right. So, it, you know, it's like when you go to college, there are certain things that you, you know, you gravitate towards. You want to be in business school. You want to be at the Elliott School. You want to be, you know, a lawyer ultimately. And so you orient yourself towards that. And, and most people know that because they have certain interests and skills in that area. Well, the same thing is for entrepreneurs. Basically, what you need to do is go and, and say, you know, this is what this is the strength of our business or our team or the opportunity, right? So let me step back two seconds on that. Mm -hmm. I have entrepreneurs who have worked in an industry for quite some time, and they have a team that they've assembled that is that they've worked together several on several businesses or in several corporations. And, and are well-oiled in executing on ideas or projects. Now, that's frankly, that's all a lot of investors need to hear. This is a team that can execute. This is an A team. They know each other and they'll figure it out. Others have a technology that is very ripe for marketing right now. Everybody's looking for, like telehealth right now, 
You know, everybody wants to do either telehealth or teleeducation or something remote engagement. So all those people who could not get anybody to pay attention to them a while ago, and they had to go with other core competencies that they had, now can their core competency now is we have a technology that helps you connect remotely with patients, students, um, uh, or, or anybody else that you're trying to do business with. And, and, and then you have other people who have other core competencies. What I like to see is that they lead with that. Hmm. And so, so an investor really likes when you come in and you have something that says, I can put my hook in that and I know that it's going to go somewhere as opposed to, listen, there's a big problem out there and we're going to try to solve it. And let me explain to you what the problem is and how all the pieces you know, are out there and where people are having problems with. One of the things investors really don't like is if you don't know your audience and you don't know who, you also don't know who buys your product. So what we often see is a lot of people focusing on the end user. And the minute you walk into an investor and you say, we're here to solve the problem of you know, seniors who can't get access to information or don't know how to use their medications or, you know, we, we're focusing on students when neither those patients or the students are actually going to be writing the checks or paying the bills. So who are you appealing to that has the problem who needs a solution? And that's one that it takes a very long time, even for very seasoned people to understand. They get very admired in their technology, um, or educating the world about something that most people are educated about. Yeah, makes sense. So I heard you talk eloquently already about, about doing your homework, getting prepared, knowing who your audience is. Anything else that, 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 a, that a, uh, a, an entrepreneur should do before that pitch? What, what else mm -hmm. do they do to get, to get ready for the pitch before they even walk in the room? So one of the hardest things I think that people, that people don't do, one, one of the things they don't do is Talk about their plan. Um, we call it, uh, we, at Springboard, we require all of the entrepreneurs to write what we call a, do a milestone slide, which basically is A to Z, what you've accomplished, what your plan is to accomplish over the next three or four or five years. And, and for invest, if you're looking for investors, what's, what's your quote unquote exit? So, you know, are you going to go for a sale? You're going to try to go public or some other aspect, private equity, sell in, all acquire other businesses. And, but, but really what we're looking for is that you understand the hurdles that you're going to have to uh, go through. And if you don't know that, what's ahead of you or have some idea of what it's going to be or what you're planning. So in other words, I've got, you know, I've got a product and, and I'm looking for, you know, to actually uh, refine it. And, um, and so I'm looking for money to help me refine the product so I can actually get it tried out in the market. And this is what, you know, I'm going to have to find a manufacturer. I'm going to have to, you know, go find, you know, a way to get out to the market with a prototype and, Okay, great. So you're going to need a little bit of money for that. Great. We know that you need some social media money, maybe a Kickstarter campaign. And then when you've spent that money, you're going to look like this. You know, this is what you're going to look like. So I'm raising $100,000 to get that, you know, minimum viable product into the market, you know, a test market, beta test. And, you know, all that is going to it's going to lead me to this point in about six months and great. And at six months, I'm going to raise $2 million in order to now go to three different jurisdictions with my product and start the next product. Ah, great. We understand that. We think that's reasonable. 
um, given what you've told us about the product and the market and what you anticipate. And so I'm going to bet that you're, because you've already told me, you know, that you know what you're doing and you know how long it's going to take to do it. I'm going to bet that you're probably right. Um, sometimes you're a little unrealistic <laughs> about that yeah. and they can push back on you and say, you know, I think, you know, you think you're going to get that minimum viable product in two weeks. That's almost impossible. That's not going to happen. It's going to take you months and months to get into the proper market. And these days, if your market requires that you see people one-on-one -on -one and have sit downs and talk with them, it's going to take you a year. So is that money going to produce enough results? Um, and I, I hope that makes sense, yeah. but it's, it's such an interesting concept of what am I going to look like when I spend your money? <laughs> exactly right. So let, let's, let's focus in on some, some specific things about women pitching to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell another, another, another Amy Millman story, but I guess it was last a year ago, fall, um, you invited me to the kickoff of the G women program and, and yeah. GW had brought in a dozen really outstanding women uh, who had early stage startups and you put them through their paces. Then the first thing was a pitch. And so there were like doctoral people, women, a, a law student with a doctorate in, in, uh, in biochemistry, right? And <laughs> a, a woman who had worked in, uh, in clinics with autistic children for years. And they got up and told their story about themselves and they omitted some of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, no guy, guys would have, would have been bragging about it. And I know this is overgeneralized, but you know, it would have been, would have been exaggerating all this stuff. These women hid, hid the, like the most interesting parts of themselves. What mm -hmm. do you see that widespread and any insights into why that is or how to correct it? I mean, nobody, nobody likes a braggart, right? Nobody wants to hear everybody saying I'm great. I'm great all the time. Where's that line? And, and, and how, how do you, how do you guide <laughs> folks to get on that right point? On the yeah, well, well, for 20 years, Lex, I have been seeing women ex outstandingly brilliant and accomplished women, um, not talk about themselves at all. I mean, there are tons of books about, about this, you know, they, you know, women don't ask, um, you know, how to more confidence. For me, it's not really about confidence that's causing this because they're pretty confident in what they know, mm -hmm. you know, being, if, if you're a scientist or you're a, a political scientist or you're a, um, you know, international affairs person, you know your area, you feel confident in your area, but not when you're pitching a business to somebody else. It's very difficult to do that. You know, it's just like standing up on a stage all by yourself, you know, speaking to an audience. I mean, it's very um, stressful situation. What we find, we found with the women is that they have been acculturated pretty much through their entire lives by not talking about themselves, by asking others about themselves. Or if, you know, if a woman, you know, brags about herself or says, you know, laudatory things about her accomplishments, people, people don't react well about it. Mm. They don't, they don't get excited about being around them as much unless they exude a certain confidence and they tell a story about it. Mm. And so Oftentimes you'll get people to pitch and a lot of our women would pitch and they, they get just the, the stats, the facts. And, and the problem with it is that everybody wants to hear a story. They wanna know how you came up with this. What is it that is driving you? How are you gonna be the one to lead and execute it? And in order, and most people will look at a woman sitting up on a stage unless they're like Oprah or somebody, and, and they'll assume that you're the marketing person or you know somebody hired to give the presentation. And that was what was going on for a good 10, 15 years when we started Springboard is they just assumed that they weren't the CEO. And it was really hard to get them to think otherwise until you said, I'm the founder, you know, I have a background in this, and um, this is why I'm the one to lead this. And you have to declare those things, however uncomfortable it makes you feel. 
it's not a place to be humble, right? It's not a place to play small. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's the, that's a main message. It also requires some persistence. I mean, I, I, nobody likes to be rejected or beyond that or told that their idea is dumb, but that's part of the game, isn't it? Well, I think this is what we learned at Springboard from the like day one in when we were doing our first program in Silicon Valley and these astonishingly brilliant people worked at Microsoft and Apple and everything come in and they're so humble and we're saying, well, who are you? You know, uh, what position do you have? We have no idea whether or not you have any you know, did someone just tell you to come up and give the pitch for the company? I mean, we'd say that just to egg them on. And of, after a while, we started realizing we need to make this a very serious part of the conversation. Who are you with relationship to this business? And why should we invest in you? Whether it's investing our time, our resources, our finances, or whatever, we need to know who you are because you're the, you're the jockey. Yep. And, and so the, so we spend pretty much a lot of the beginning of our time talking about them. Who are you? Talk, tell us about how you came up with this or why you're the person that's leading it. What's your credentials? And once they get support and in, in encouragement, it changes the whole dynamic. And we felt that way at G Women mm -hmm. is, oh, when we first met them, you know, you had to pull it out that they had some experience. Some of them had had formed, you know, community group back when they were in high school, you know, that changed people's lives. Never mentioned it, never talked about it, or just referenced it as if they had been part of the of the groups when they had actually made it all happen. Tell us that you may you can make it all happen. Yep. And, and so that we can follow you. We want to follow you. We want to be, you know, a part of your success. And how about dealing with rejection? And it seems to me you, you got to kiss a lot of frogs and before you find a <laughs> prince, right? Uh, That's my favorite line. You know, it's like, you know, I, I never talk really about failure at all. You know, entrepreneurship is an iterative process. You learn, it, it's like, it's like, college, you know, you're a freshman, you learn a little bit, which then lets you, you know, understand a little bit more about being a sophomore. And then by the time you graduate, you know, somebody, you know, you go to graduate school or something where somebody hires you because you have developed certain skills. And, and that, you know, but that doesn't mean you're not going to fail a couple of tests or papers along the way, you know, it, this is what I always say. I have a lot of students that work for me over the years, probably about 500 at this point over 20 years, um, uh, and most of them from GW. And what I say is this, you know, I'll know within two weeks whether you are the kind of person who fades when you get critiqued or gets defiant and says, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so this whole entire thing is rejection is just, he's just not into you, you know, or you need to do some more work. Show me that you can do better work next time. Take what I have to say, figure out how that factors in and then, uh, you know, and then go forward. And it's, it's such an important thing to know. And so I spend a lot of time with those students that are not used to being told that it's not up to snuff mm -hmm. and say, all right, how would you do it differently? How would you think a little differently? You know, look at it from another person's point of view. Does that change the way you would have approached that issue? And, yeah. and then you, you watch them, you know, wow. You know, I have a different, I've never thought about it that way. I have a different way to look at it. So having been involved in pitching and investing now for, for quite a few years, uh, we take for granted that the process is well understood. But in my experience, it's really opaque. I don't think outsiders really know what the heck is going on. It takes years. 
and it's probabilistic, right? You could have a great, great idea. And, and as you say, if, if it doesn't strike that investor, I mean, my ex you're not, you're not going to get anywhere, right? I see this in the new venture competition all the time where really good teams just don't hit those judges right. And I'm sorry, it's, it's cruel and it's unfair, but um, the ones who say, well, I'm going to do better next time, right? I'm just going to, I'm not going to be deterred. I, I think that's a, I don't know what you call that, grit or perseverance or something, but mm -hmm. you got to have it to, uh, to succeed in this business, it seems well, to me. Well, you know, there's a great story around that, Lex. Um, on, uh, when we first met Robin Chase, who was the founder of Zipcar. And so Zipcar was the first car sharing technology out there. Back in 2000, she came back from a trip to Europe and where this idea was there. And she said, we should do that here. You know, why should we have so many cars on the road if people don't need them? And especially for students, you know, she was from Cambridge, um, uh, you know, around Harvard, you know, they don't need to have their cars there. And so the whole thing was, you know, okay, great. What a great idea. Car sharing. You know, everybody can share cars parked somewhere in the, in the area. And, and the investors all said, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I mean, we heard it from probably 20 of the biggest investors, both in California and in Boston. That's, you know, everybody has a car or everybody can get a car, you know, or they can rent a car. Well, that's not true. So we came to GW with Robin and we said, let's put a zip car on campus. And that was the beginning of all of a sudden people saying, oh, well, I can borrow that car using, you know, a technology that allowed me to just flash it. I mean, nobody was doing that then, you know, and basically she started the whole idea of, you know, I mean, Uber probably wouldn't have been there, you know, fleet management for cities and localities, um, you know, changed everything because of her technology. But I will tell you, for three years, that was like pushing a rock up a hill. Nobody got it. So you, you've spoken already about proper preparation, knowing your audience, knowing your market, knowing your customers, um, being tenacious. Uh, what else? We, we don't have a lot of time left. What else is on top of mind that people do in your experience that undermine them when they pitch to investors or, or, or other folks? Anything else that sticks well, out? Well, you know, I often say entrepreneurship is not a spectator sport, but it actually goes a little further than that. It is not something that you can do alone at all. Mm. You have to have a network. You have to be able to get out there and be engaging and find people with expertise and, and you know, not just social media, but actual, you know, engaging. So one of my favorite stories is about one of our entrepreneurs that in order to meet the people that she wanted to meet in the last two years, she's gone on all of these Zoom chats or hop in or wherever it is and looked at the participants in that room and chatted them up and asked them if they would have a call afterwards. And in doing so, she met the CEO of Xerox, who she was trying to sell into. And she sent a note that actually commented on something that that CEO had said. And the next thing, they were doing business. But, you know, how creative to not just listen in, but to engage. And so I talk a lot about the importance of engaging, importance of whoever, you know, if you're in a room with people, we will be at some point again, um, you know, who's in the room? Did someone say something that was interesting? Go figure it out. If they commented on you, go immediately and figure out how to get in touch with them. If you're on a Zoom call or whatever, you know, it's a networking 101 figure out there's a couple of people, you know, I just, let's just see whether or not there's some, something about our connection that will result in, you know, a positive for me. Yeah, in my experience, uh, my experience. and it's counterintuitive, uh, networking is, a, is an end, not a means. So I know you network to get something, but 
it's that's backwards you have to do it when you don't want anything right you have to go meet interesting right. people whenever you can and you have to be an interesting person <laughs> whenever you meet <laughs> these folks right and then somehow magically it comes back right and then because when the time is right they're there they're in your network you can call up and say what about this i think it's doubly true for investors right you want to go meet talk to investors uh, well before you need them right get in their network yeah. get on their on their on their radar be visible right and just like when I was a lobbyist, sometimes I'd walk into a member of Congress's office. I wasn't looking for anything. I wasn't selling anything. I just wanted to know. I heard you guys put a bill in that had nothing to do with what I was interested in. You know, how can I help? Or I'm interested in learning more about that because I think I can make a connection for you. I mean, it's, it, it is that engagement that matters so much. The people that get money, the people that advance those businesses are the ones who put themselves out there. And from a person like me, who, who it's hard to believe for a lot of people, I was incredibly introverted um, growing up. And I'd have to force myself to walk into a big, you know, a fundraising play, you know, uh, meeting and with strangers all around me and figure out how to walk out of there with something really valuable. Um, that, you know, that was worth my walking into that room other than, you know, to get a glass of beer or something. Yeah. So we're, we're starting to get close to our, our end time. We have a hard stop at 1130. I would like to shift gears and open the floor up to questions uh, from, from the participants. I don't know if it, there's a Q&A function. Um, there's also the chat. I think, Tammy, is that the best way to do it? Either one of those will work. Um, there is a question that came in earlier from Bonnie. Uh, does this all apply to technical um, uh, startups? Is, is, is anything here that um, we've talked about that doesn't, does, wouldn't apply to a social venture or, or, or some other type of startup? Yeah, I think it applies to everybody, but I will say this, about 80 to 90% of the people out there um, investing um, are not investing in, well, that's not true. These days it's probably better. So about 75% of the people will invest in something technical, um, uh, whether it's science-based or, or technology-based. But honestly, you know, it, you have to understand what whoever it is you're going out there to pitch, whether it's somebody who you want to do business with, you want to sell your product into, um, or you want to get money from. Honestly, you know, it, it's the same. You just have to know what they care about. And then, you know, make sure that you're focusing your presentation on that um, uh, in some way that it's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, uh, other questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A or the chat. Anybody want to uh, throw something out? Um, if, if well, I'll, I'll, I'll be watching. I'll, oh, here, we, here we go. When's the right time to mention your startup idea in networking events as part of your story? Is there a time when it's too soon to mention the details behind a startup? Good question, Renata. Thank you. Uh, so we always say, be very careful with what you reveal. And in a networking event, basically you're saying, oh, you know, we're building something that addresses this problem. And then that's it you know, and, and not get into the details of all of what you're doing. But I always have something that makes them, whoever I'm talking to, makes them think that I, you know, it's like a teaser. We talk about elevator pitches being a kind of a teaser. Mm -hmm. Elevator pitches are not, you know, several paragraphs. They're basically one line or a tagline, you know, uh, you know, I'm solving uh, you know, a problem that most students have with uh, uh, buying online or, or leaving their dorm rooms or, uh, you know, I'm, you know, helping parents uh, as the last uh, new venture competition winner did. I'm helping uh, people with autism function uh, effectively in the workplace. And um, wow, that's interesting. Tell us more about that. That's a conversation starter. 
Um, and, you know, then she'll tell a story as she has about her background and, you know, why she came up with the idea. And that's basically it. And then, you know, hopefully they'll want to learn more and, you know, have a longer conversation after that. Yep. Yeah. I, I, my, my rule of thumb is, my general rule of thumb is people, problems, and solutions. So when you meet somebody, talk about them first. Yeah. And then if you want to talk about the problem you're working on or the problem they're working on, that's a nice open-ended conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, save your solution, save your product, your idea until pretty, pretty late in the conversation until you, you understand those other things. Makes sense. So a uh, couple of other questions. Um, how about Q&A? You've seen a million Q&A. How, how do you, what kind of advice do you give to uh, entrepreneurs for dealing with Q&A, especially not looking defensive? Yeah. Um, again, I always usually put it back on the person who asks, um, you know, wow, where did that, that, where did that question come from? Or did you have an, you know, was there a, you know, an experience that you had that you asked that question? <laughs> it's, oh, instead of, or, or, you know, as I always say in media, answer the question that you wish you were asked. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people do that to a point where it's not effective, but um, I always try, as you just said about, you know, networking, I always try to basically put it back on the person saying, oh, I wonder where that question came out of. What was your experience in that? And then I know how to answer it after that. Um, it's almost like uh, being a mirror onto the people who's asking the question. Mm. Did you sometimes do you ever see test questions where they're asking a question that looks like they actually don't care the answer that is they're looking for something else sometimes I, I I've seen pitches where folks ask about the financials so that, yeah. what's your gross margin in the third year and they don't really yeah. care what the gross <laughs> margin is in the third year but they do want to see that you've mastered the numbers right that you are mm -hmm. intimate with the with the uh, the income pro form income statement is that you see that at all we see all of those. I mean, you know, some people, sometimes investors are just bored. <laughs> and, and so they, you can always tell when they're bored or they're not paying attention really, or they just want the thing to end or they're just being silly. And, and, you know, they're not really interested. So they put those questions out there or, you know, when was the last time you went and talked to a hundred of your high potential market people, you know, it's like, Again, answer the question you wish you were asked mm -hmm. and, and know that this is just a practice. Then when they ask those kinds of questions, it's a practice session. Or maybe what, is, what they're saying basically is we need to know that you know your numbers. Mm -hmm. And so have you thought through that? And, you know, we, you know, say, you know, we've been examining our competition and this is what you know, has happened to them over the last three or four years, and we think we can do better. So we're using them as the model, or, you know, we're competing against eBay, um, and we know that eBay was great for a while until a lot of other people sort of came in doing something similar. We think that model works, or the Amazon model works, but we're just going to take it one step further. And Yes. Do I know exactly what three years is going to look like? This is what I hope, based on our plan, um, we'll be able to say. Um, but don't hold me to it. Uh, just, you know, I'm looking for people to work with us so that that plan will be successful. And, and I, I've heard people say that and other people saying, wow, you know, what a great answer. What you should never say in response to a question as sort of a placeholder before you get your thought process is that's a really good question because people now immediately know that you don't know an answer or haven't thought it through yep I, i'd also i also and this is like young people will answer a question that's not a yes no question with yes so you ask a question <laughs> they say yes well don't, don't, don't do that they just answer the question I, yeah. I guess i'm getting old in fact ellen Ellen has asked a question. Do you think investors look less favorably on more mature people? I think she's asked that question with me in mind, but uh, is, there a, is, there a, yeah. is there an age discrimination for or against? 
You know, again, it all depends on who you're going into. Um, I, I, I do have a story about one of our entrepreneurs who um, was pitching her technology. It was a video technology some years ago. And the investor happened to be probably younger than her son um, said, you know, we would look at your company if there was a male running it. Mm -hmm. So next time bring in, you know, the guys, she was, the, she's actually the, the chief information officer, uh, CTO, CIO of the, of the state of Colorado. So um, right now having sold her business, but I, you know, I think about that uh, and, you know, we have a lot of those, you know, some of it is trash talk. Um, and some of it is, you know, just ignorance uh, on the part of them. That just means to you, it's time to go and visit with somebody else. Yeah, yeah it seems to me the right response to that is, I, I would consider letting you invest in my company if you weren't such a jerk, right? I mean, yeah, you know, it's yeah. We had uh, one one of the investors in the very early days said to a woman with a PhD in, in biochemistry. Um, and had been a senior person at Stanford's Biodesign Center. Um, if this company is so good, why isn't your husband running it? And, um, <laughs> and it was trash talk. They invested big time after that, yeah. but they wanted to see what her reaction would be. Yeah. You know, it's a tough business. And, uh, uh, and so yeah. you, have, you have to be able to roll with the punches. All right, I think we got time for maybe one more question. Uh, Nelsia has asked uh, one that we should have asked a long time ago about uh, women and the ability to do work, 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 family, work life balance. Any, uh, any, any wisdom there? Can you can you have it all as an entrepreneur, female um, entrepreneur? Well, they always say what do they say about Ginger Rogers. Uh, she did everything that Fred Astaire did, but backwards <laughs> and in heels. Um, listen, it, it's so personal. You know, it's really up to the person. I used to say, you know, uh, honestly, that that being an entrepreneur gave you a lot more freedom to manage your life and your all the, the little parts of it. Um, but it really is a personality thing. It's what is important to you and what you place your emphasis on. Um, a lot of my entrepreneurs not only are they birthing businesses, they're birthing lots of babies. Um, you know, I used to have a wall of all of the children born by my entrepreneurs, all the <laughs> pictures up there um, can do a lot of things, multitasking a lot of things and figuring it all out. It is not easy and it's not for everybody. And so that's a really important thing to know about yourself. What's important? What do you want to compartmentalize certain parts of your life? And entrepreneurship is a full contact sport. Mm -hmm. So you really want to be aware of that, whether you're building a consumer product um, or doing a service or you're uh, building a new technology or solving, you know, cancer, you know, for forever. And I, I just, I think that everybody has to look deep in themselves and say, you know, especially on entrepreneurship, is there anything else that I can do other than this? Because that's what I should do. Because entrepreneurship is one of those things where if you're not completely 100% in it, you can't be successful. I think that's exactly right. I think on that note, we should quit. It's uh, there's only a minute left. Got, we got questions about contact information. I have put my name and email in the in the chat. Amy, you might want to do the same. Um, Springboard Enterprises is at sb.co. Uh, so you, right. can, you, can, you can get to Amy's uh, uh, site there and learn more about Springboard. I wish we had more time. This was really fascinating. Um, uh, you know what? Um, you didn't put a uh, a discussion of new venture competition and, and why that's important. Yeah, I I can do it quickly in the in the time we have. Uh, get more help. Get expert help. There's nothing that, that 
in, in this that, that requires you to do it without help from other people. You need practice. Do a dolphin tank. Do Pitch George if you're a GW student. Do the new venture competition. Uh, there's lots of mentorship resources out there. The GW Mentors and Residents. I would recommend for everybody from GW community, uh, go find the Mentors and Residents and, and meet with them. Uh, there's lots and lots of opportunities to get up this learning curve. And uh, you got to be in it to win it. So that's, uh, I think with that, we're going to quit. How to show up.